All right, so this is the January 30th uh, lab about instant gratification with Rails. So let's get into it. So here we have our prompt. Can everybody see that? Okay, here we go. So uh, did any, okay, I won't even say that. Let me, let me go. So basically, the first thing we'll see is that there's a program called Rails called, and you can off with many, many commands. And by the way, you're welcome to follow along. Uh, if you get stuck, you can wave your hand and Amin will come over and help you, but I will try not to slow down. So most likely the way this always goes is about a third of the way through, people start fall, dropping like flies. It's more important to, to listen than to do it. Do your best. So there's a program called Rails. Boom. It's a command line program, and it has a bunch of important jobs. The first one is to create a framework. So if I do Rails new demo, notice, by the way, that I'm sitting in my MyDev directory. Because Rails new demo, you're going to create a directory. So we create the directory that contains the application. Because remember, a server and Rails is just a bunch of Ruby code. So I'm going to say Rails new demo. And we wait while it does its work. So basically, it's, I'm going to look at these files. I've created all these files. It's, uh, it's templated it, basically what every application needs. And at the bottom, it's going to do what well, went by already. It ran Bundler, and don't worry too much about Bundler. Think of it as magic, but it makes sure that you have all the right gems, that is, all the right libraries that you can use. Okay? So now we can go CD, because the directory we created is called that. And if we see what's in there, okay, we see it's a pretty big directory with a lot of stuff in it. So it created all this code already, okay? And, um, Okay, so interestingly enough, the important directories, if I look here at the top level directories, some of the most important directories here are the app directory, which contains all your application code. Actually, that is the most important, so I'll just stop there. I won't talk about any of this yet. So inside the app directory, you'll see the most important building blocks of your Rails app. So if I go in there and I look at it like this, we see that it has three important subdirectories. Uh, controllers, models, and views. Those are the, the core ones. Does you ever heard of model view controller? We're going to learn what it is. And there they are. Now, the, the re by the way, feel free to, to wave if you have a question, whatever. Okay, I'm willing to stop and explain. Um, so it's created all those, it's all canned software, it's all standardized. And if I go and I look inside, oh, I didn't want to do that. Okay, there, there we are. That's the whole thing. Um, we see that inside of app, we see models, nothing in there, controllers. See a little bit of a little bit of uh, Ruby code there. If we look inside of, um, for example, config, see a bunch of Ruby code in here. It's created all this canned code, and this canned code can be modified by you. It's not pristine. It's not top secret. It's all Saving you typing, basically. Now, many of these files you will never touch, but a lot of them you will, all right? So, um, the interesting thing is that already I've created a dummy, dummy server. It doesn't do much, but it does something. But it's not running yet. So the first thing I have to do is run the server. Remember, a server is just an application. It's a program that sits and listens if anybody has a request. And if somebody has a request, it responds to it. So I have to run this program. Okay. Fine. I'm going to run Rails server. Okay, now my Rails server is running. And some interesting stuff here. You see that it's, now those of you who are a little bit into the web know about port numbers. Don't worry about it too much for now, but it's an aspect of the way the server works is what port is it listening to. So you can see here the server has started and it's listening on port 3000, version numbers, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's listening on port 3000, right? So, what do I do to test that? What I do to test that? Yeah, run the browser, right? So I'm going to do 0.0.0, .0 and look at that. I have a real server running. This is literally, this, this could be, I mean, in fact, if we, if we did a bunch of work, we could figure out what IP address this computer has, and you could access it from your machines and see the same page, because this is now running a real server. 
So we have a Rails server that's running. It doesn't do much, obviously, but we have it running. Okay? Um, right. So now let's start making it work for me a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to make it be a little bit more special. So the first thing I have to do is think about... Um, let me go to my whiteboard here. So I have already, you know, the root. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat this over and over again. Okay. So pretend that's always there. I'm not gonna type it in every time. So I already told it what to do when I access that, the root. Okay. And we saw it here. We access the root. There's nothing there. That's what it says. Let me try to access something else. Let me access instead of that slash say slash hello. Now remember what I said, that the job of the server is simply to, re to receive a request and generate an HTML page, right? I have to tell the server what I think this is supposed to mean, because otherwise it doesn't know what to do. In fact, if I type that in, not surprisingly, I get an error. It says, I don't know what say hello means. Okay, a, that, that's a get command that's gotten from HTTP from the browser. It doesn't know what to do with it. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to teach it what say hello means. And the way we're going to do it is to use something that you see a lot in Rails, which is a generator. There are numerous generators, and a gen the word generator is a little program, a little utility, which takes some parameters and creates some Ruby code for you. If the parameters are wrong, in other words, if I say, the example I'm going to use is right out of the book, um, generate controller, say hello, goodbye. Let me just do it here. Rails, generate controller, say hello, goodbye. OK, I'm not going to hit enter yet. If I made a mistake here, it was a typo here. Right? Then the code that it generates would be incorrect. Okay, let's say I misspelled goodbye. I have two choices. I can either go delete the files it created, because it created a bunch of files for me for free, or I can just edit them because they're just files that are now my files. I can do with them whatever I want. Now some people argue that generators are not a good idea because they give you instant gratification. You do, you know, you get the program running very easily. But as a programmer, you're not forced to understand what's going on. Okay? So we'll use generators, but as we go forward and you guys get more sophisticated, I'm going to try to get you to wean yourself off of generators because you really want to understand what's going on. But a generator is just a program. In this case, it's a subcommand of the Rails utility that generates code. Okay? So let's do it. And it'll say what a generator. That's all the stuff it generated. All this code, you don't have to write any of this code. It generated views, it generated unit tests, generated some JavaScript, all kinds of stuff. Okay? By the way, before I continue, let me just illustrate something, which is that Rails is just a program. So if I just type Rails by itself, it tells me all the commands. And it's just another command line utility. It has a generate command, a console command, a server command, new command. The one that you, you will use the most often is Rails console and Rails server. Uh, What's the Rails console? It basically puts you into an IRB or PRI session, but with the whole Rails environment loaded at the same time. Very, very useful for debugging. And you'll be using that a lot. But let me go back to what, um, what just happened, which is that it created a bunch of, actually I shouldn't have done because we could have looked at it. But anyway, the, the big things it created let me go to my editor now. Okay. Are a couple of files in the controller directory. Here it is. Now, I'm getting to something very, very fundamental that I'm going to say for the first time now, and you're going to barely understand it. I'm going to say it many more times in the coming weeks, and then you'll understand it. Well, some of you will understand it. But essentially, what the way Rails interprets this is that it parses this URL, and that parsing is done by a subsystem called the router, because it routes requests, and decides what bit of code should run. 
And that job of that bit of code that runs in the end is to generate HTML. So the idea is if I have one URL, which is supposed to show me a list of all the different vapor parts, and I have another, Ken looks up, and I have another URL that's supposed to show me a list of all my to dos, Miranda looks up, then it routes it over to the code that knows how to do that, and that code that's showing all the vapor parts asks the database, what's the list of vapor parts you've got? It says, I've got these 10, and it looks at them and creates an HTML page that puts the 10 on it and returns it. So the notion of routing means what do I do with a particular URL, the stuff after the slash, to identify the piece of code in the server that should run, and the job of the piece of code in the end is to generate HTML. And that, by the way, is the fundamental uh, concept of MVC. The content, concept of MVC is M stands for model, which is really data. Okay? The database, in a way, is part of the model. But it, it rep represents the persistent state. It represents the information that the, that the server knows when nobody's using it. Okay? The controller, well, let me go to the view first. The view can look at the database and come up with a way to display the information in the database. Okay? So that's what the view is the display. The display is a set of templates that say, well, I've got to put the headers over here and the scroll bars over there, whatever else. But the data, row by row, of all the little vaporator things or all the different appointments is coming out of the database. So the view essentially is able to use data from the database to generate HTML. And the controller is the one that controls the world. So the controller gets the request and uses the model. So actually, this, this line technically goes more like this to find out what's going on and then ask the view to create a view. and then it returns its answer this way. Okay? So that's the model view and control. And you'll find examples of each of those in, in the source code that's built by the data server. Okay? So in this case, this little bit of code here is going to get executed whenever the rail server we're building detects that the main part of the URL is say and the final part of the URL was hello. So, to show you something, to illustrate this before we even get into views, because this, even though it looks like magical code, it's just Ruby. So I can actually say here, put s, I am calling, or I, no, let me put it this way, the say controller was called. And I save that. And I can go back here. In fact, I can leave, interestingly enough, I can leave the rail server running. The rail server is still running. It runs all the time. And if I now go here, I see, first of all, a proper web page. And I'll explain how this happened. But if I actually now look at the server, you'll see here, there's that put S. So again, try to accept the fact that the rail server is just a bit their code. And the controller got called because the hello part of the URL was seen. The controller says this hello method knows how to create the page. The hello Hey, where's my editor? Must be hiding. Okay. The hello controller gets called and it prints that. So by that logic, I should also be able to say it puts to goodbye here. And I just save it, OK? And if I go over here and I change the hello to goodbye, fine. I'll explain how that happens. But if we go back to our server, we see that now there's that put S. All this other stuff is locked data that the server puts out automatically. And some of it is useful, some of it is not. Okay? All right. Now, you might wonder, uh, how did this web page appear? Let's see. Yeah, that's fine. 
how does this web page, so this is HTML, right? So if I do show source here, if you are whatever it is nowadays, uh, I see here, there's HTML that was generated, right? There it is. HTML was sent back by the server and the browser displayed it. So query, where did that HTML come from? Well, I just mentioned the view. The view is the one who knows how to generate HTML. So let's take a look at that, okay? So I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna look into my views subdirectory and lo and behold, I see that the same controller name, say, is also being used as a directory inside of the views. And in there we find two files, goodbye and hello. Pretend these are just HTML files for a moment. I'll explain more why it says .erg as well. But if you know HTML, and most of you know HTML to some extent, right? You'll see this is just HTML. Okay, which means we have to believe then that if I modify this file, hello cs236b, okay, I modify this file. Now remember, I'm sitting on the server. The server is actually on the moon, and I'm a client on Earth accessing the server. So they're, they're on, my, on one computer, but think of them as in totally different places. And I modified one file on the server, which is called hello.html.erb. And if I now run my, my client, and I go back to hello, not goodbye, and there it is. So the browser requested from the rail server that URL. The rail server is on the moon. That URL is parsed. That file is found in the views directory, and it's Sent back, yes. So the, the source is interpreted as each request, then, right? Because you can change the dynamics of that. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Um, two, two reasons for that. One of them is that's the way it is, but also because the way the rail, the rail server is now operating in development mode. And in development mode, you can actually make changes to the code or the HTML, and it'll automatically be incorporated. In production mode, which we won't worry about it for a while, and you would actually have to stop the server and restart it. Okay? All right. Now, um, it turns out that the reason these files are called .erb, that erb stands for embedded Ruby. Okay? And that means that we can actually put Ruby code inside of these files. And I'll show you a simple example. I can say uh, sum of 1 plus 1, and then I'm going to do this magic here. If I go here, well, I forgot the equal sign. Put the equal sign in. I do, but you can see that the browser is very um, good, very friendly. Okay, now let's see what happened here. If I look at the HTML, am I going to see that percent ER percent angle bracket thing or not? Why not? Pardon? Yeah, and, but who did that? Who executed that Ruby code? The client or the server? Right, the server. Right. So if I look at this, if I look at this code, we see just straight out text. If you can look down here, okay. If we go back over here, we see that what happened was the stuff in light blue there. If you can see it, anyway, the stuff here between the angle of that. The reason that's written that way is that there's a preprocessor, a program running on the server, which scans this file and looks for all places where there's angle bracket percent and knows that. When it finds that, it's going to find in there Ruby code, and it's going to execute it and use that instead of the angle bracket. It's basically going to rip out this bit, give it to the Ruby interpreter, and put whatever comes back in that bit. And that little trick is the building block of a lot of very complicated things. So let me give you another example. Since we all know Ruby now, I could say I equals... Uh, 
Uh, no, but I'm just doing it for clarity. Let's see what I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen now, so that's kind of fun. So we go over here, and we see that nothing came out. Put an equal sign here, and we see something coming out. So uh, if I say here, put s, all right, um, <laughs> uh, oh, maybe I have to say this, percent i dot each, try this, um, percent close, percent equals, put s, i times 1,000, percent close. Oh, I got to put a two here. Percent end. Let's see if I got it right this time. And then I'll explain what I did. Nope, didn't work. All right, I won't worry about it now. Anybody know, can explain what's wrong? Yes? I think you shouldn't have a percent times one. I think you just have it at the beginning of all of your routine and you can't have all of it. There we go. Uh, this looks like an infinite loop to me, doesn't it? No, it did something. That's very interesting. Uh, anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain what I did, and then we can worry about why. We can leave it as an exercise for the readers. Oh, yes. Thank you. Exactly. So I should put here x, and then it should do what I expect. Thank you. Boom. OK? Now. The ones that are eagle-eyed amongst you notice that there's percent and percent equals. And for the first three years of you doing Rails, you're going to get them too mixed up and type the wrong mm -hmm. one in. You're going to spend hours debugging because nothing's coming out and you can't figure out why. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> it happens a lot. So basically, they both interpret the code inside the angle brackets. But percent does not put any text into the resulting file. So you use it for control structures like this. Percent equals, just like I did before, just like I did up here, interpret that, and it puts whatever it comes up with in the text. And so you end up with three instances of the number x times 1,000, so 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. No equal signs here means that this does not put anything in the output. It just simply is controlling the flow. And you'll see this construct a lot. Angle bracket percent means Ruby code. Percent equals means Ruby code and actually make a change to the page. So if I go over here, I see here that it's just like that. Okay, it's simply three numbers. Okay? This is the HTML for the page. Yeah, straight out of HTML. Okay? Now it has quotes in it. That's pretty interesting. Um, and also, they don't appear here, which is pretty interesting, too. Maybe this is a thing about, um, yeah, I don't know what that is, the equal sign, the, the quotes. Because they don't appear up here. Anyway, let's not worry about that yet. Pardon? Oh, how do you get this? You have to know your, I think it's plugins or whatever they're doing. Turn on the Okay. I'm going to go back to the. I'm going to go back to the text now. <laughs> I'm going to do a few very simple things. Um, let's say I wanted to say over here. Oops. Go back to the code. So we're still sitting in hello that HTML that ERP. We haven't modified the other one. And I'm going to say something else. I'm going to say H2. Hello. Keto, H2. Go over here. There's hello, Pito, right? Just static text that gets taken from the server and sent to the client. But let's say instead I want to say hello to anybody. Let's say I'm going to grab the name out of the database and I want to display hello to that person. So we go to the controller. We refer back to the controller. And we're going to say here, at user's name equals pedo. Now, what's the 
what happens is that the flow of control is the router says, ah, say, I'm going to call the say controller, hello, I'm going to call the hello action, is what they're called, the hello action, execute it, and when it's done executing, it's going to render the hello HTML page. So there's three stages. Find the controller, find the action, find the view. And the router does all that. So um, the controller is called the say controller. The action is called the hello action. And the view is called the hello view. Those are the three bits that have to come into play. OK? Now, here's a little bit of interesting magic. When I, in the say controller, assign a value to an instance variable like that, that instance variable is still going to be around when it gets to the view. And that's important. Okay? So that means that when I go to the view, and I, instead of saying hello pedo, I say percent equals at user's name. I think that's what I called it. Yep. Close that. Let me put a different name. I mean. Now, if I refresh. It says hello me. What happened? Let's go back. The router analyzes the URL, called the say controller, told it to call the hello action. The hello action did the put s. So if we go back to our server, we'll see that that put s is happening all the time. Where is that server? Here it is. There's that put s. Say controller was called. Uh, yep. Oops. Uh, I'm going to do this, actually. I'm going to put this in its own little window. Even better. OK, it's going to call the say controller, call the hello action, and assign the name Amin to user's name. Next, it's going to go to the hello view. And I'll get you guys. And the hello view is just HTML with, with Ruby mixed in. And it's just a very vanilla Ruby expression here. OK, questions? Yes? Can you give another? Yeah. Well, let me illustrate by, let me, let me explain by doing something interesting. If I remove this equal sign, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? Yeah. Okay, and why does it not work? Because if you, if you imagine the way the processing works, it's a simple little program that reads this file in, and it just puts out what it saw. H1, the output is H1. Everything is the same as what it saw. H2 puts out H2. Hello puts out hello. Oh, look, it sees this. Ah, Ruby code. It executes that Ruby code, which produces a string. Okay? If there's an equal sign, it puts the string in. If there's no equal sign, it throws it out. Okay? So without the equal sign, it will never appear on the page. With the equal sign, it will always appear. So if you went back and put the equal sign for all everything up there, would you see? Let's do it. We'll, we'll, we'll see whatever values all those things return. And they're not values you care about, but I'll just we'll just do it. Ah, shoot. So put it here and refresh. And we see the one, two, three. Because why? Because the value of this assignment, everything is an expression. The assignment expression returns the value on the right hand side. Okay, we put an equal sign here. Now I don't know what the value is here. Let's refresh it and see. And it looks like the value of that loop itself is one, two, three as well. And uh, we put an equal sign on the end and refresh. We have a problem. OK, and the problem is that, do I have a typo? I guess the problem is that the end is not allowed because it's, because it's not a whole expression. It's a piece of an expression. Of course, you never actually do this. You do this. OK? Uh, other question? Yes. Ah, that's being gen I'll show you, this. There, there's templates for that, OK? Um, let me just, while the iron's hot, there's something called layouts. And this template is applied to every single page that's generated. And you can see here's what you're asking about. And then when this appears, that's where the new stuff is found. OK, yes? Um, why is it that we have one say controller with Actions, yeah. But we have different actual view files. Like, why don't we have multiple controllers also? Um, uh, 
because that's the way it is. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, it's just code. That's how they're designed. Uh, they call Rails opinionated software. Seriously. You can Google it. You'll find millions of pages. What it means is that you have two choices when you build a framework. So if you're like you should use Java and you build a web server, you know that you can pick this library for this, this library for that, this library for that. A lot of choosing has to happen. Then you have to decide how you're going to lay out your directions. And that's, that's basically super flexible. But the problem is that before you do anything, you have to make a lot of very difficult decisions. What they chose to do with the rail design is opinionated. They decided, and people will argue that the decisions were not good, but they decided that this is how the directory structure is going to look, and this is how the files are going to look. And so it's a trade off. Okay. That's all. There were more questions. Yes? Was that a question? No, I just wanted to say uh, they say many things in Rails is a convention over implementation. And if you know the convention, you don't need to prefix it. And, and, but, and that's exactly right. And when you get much more advanced, you'll find that you can actually configure everything if you want to. But it's more difficult. Okay? There were other questions. There were other questions? Who's totally lost and confused? Okay. I understand it perfectly. Kind of so so, totally confused. Come on, everybody has to have their hand up. Great, okay. All right, perfect. That's good. See, effective tutor. Hey, you didn't do it. I didn't see your hand. I did. Oh, you did? Yes. Where was it? Show me. Okay. Put, put it sideways. Huh? This is the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, yeah. So that's really for generating file sheets in JavaScript? Uh, yeah. It's not generating. It's generating the so, file sheet links. What is rendering? These are, if it's after percent equal, it's a method. Boom. It's, it, this is always, always, always Ruby code. Okay? Which means that there's a method somewhere called file sheet link tag in the Ruby library that takes this string and generates the HTML, doing all the appropriate magic in the page. So when you make changes to you, an HTML page from the method layout to the other elements in yeah. Ruby, do you make a change to this HTML page? If you want to make a change to every page, yes. On every page. Every page. You, you can have, well, you have, you have, it's much more elaborate than that. You can have collections of layouts picking different ones for different groups of pages and so on. Okay, where okay. do those things end? They end up in the same directory with different names. So you can actually have a, a file called, um, uh, say, no, it probably is goodbye.html or underscore but within the layouts directory. And that's where it looks for. There's a, there's a pretty elaborate scheme of nesting of these layouts. So this would be the outer, outermost that every page has, okay? So if for some reason you didn't want this on certain pages, you'd have to do a little bit more complicated and have a layout nested in another page. Go ahead, go ahead. That's confusing. I mean, think of it, think of it like, uh, you know, like, um, you know, uh, Russian dolls. I mean, the outside is, everybody has that, but let's say my admin pages all have a certain thing and my customer pages have another one and they have a, the layout within that for admin versus customer. And let's say inside of that, there's another collection of pages. So you can basically create, it's like they're like style sheets for collections of pages. Any other questions? Yes? So if I wanted to write my own HTML and CSS, this is where I would put it? You would put your HTML here, absolutely. But you would put your CSS. Uh, no, the CSS would be another would somewhere else. Just switch that reference to the CSS, right? Yeah, if you had a different, right, if you had, this is a built-in CSS, this is a built-in CSS, you would add more style sheet map, uh, lines here referring to your pages. Where are the style sheets? Pardon? Where are um, the style sheets are here, assets. So it actually created a say.css form if I wanted it, okay? So the assets are the images, the CSS, and the JavaScript. And actually, Ruby does some very complicated magic before it launches the server to, to uh, concatenate all those into one big file to be more efficient. But you don't, don't worry about that at all. Okay? So basically, let's say you wanted to have CSS that was only re um, relevant to this collection of views under the save command, then you can put them in here. Uh, if you had 
CSS rules that you wanted to be available everywhere, you would put them here. Okay? All right. Um, let me continue with what's in, uh, even though we sort of covered it, but let me just continue, just play out what's in the book. So, um, totally similarly, time of call. Remember now we are in a controller file that's straight up Ruby, no HTML, just regular Ruby. Okay. So I'm going to add, I'm going to assign this variable at was it time dot now right time dot no sorry equals time dot now. So now I have a variable called called time of call. Let me purposefully put a bug in here. Leave out that. Difference between with an at sign and not an at sign. This is a local variable. That's a, a, an instance variable, right? Uh, now I'm going to modify my hello file to say the time is percent equals. Sorry? Time of call, yep, thank you. Time of call. Close that H2. I go over here, I refresh the page. Um, I still have this thing up here. No, why is it giving me an error? Okay, time of call. It doesn't know what it is. Okay, not surprising. So I should put the at sign in here. Save it, refresh. Okay, it worked, but there's no time. Why did it work? It worked because instant variables return nil even if they don't exist. We just kind of suck it, but that's the way it is. So then finally, I have to correct my bug and make this an instance variable so that it now does work. Okay, so to, 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 to show that again, we're, we're doing this URL, say hello, parsed by the router, knows that the controller is say, knows that the action is hello, calls the hello action in the same controller, assign, does anything it wants, like typically it's going to be accessing the database here, getting the names of all the parts or all the calendar entries or whatever. Assigns it to an instance variable. Now it renders the view. The, the instance variable is still there when the view is rendered. <coughs> and that's how that works. Okay? All right, good. Now, we actually have two pages in this application, right? Don't forget. We have hello, and we have goodbye. Now, we haven't done much to the goodbye page. It's still there. Uh, and by the way, the fact that it says, who can tell me where in all the files that are in the server you will find, say, hashtag goodbye, find me in this file? Who, who finds it first? Come on. Uh, there's hands up already. Who, where is this file? What source file in the server has this stuff in it? Yes? Uh, good, goodbye.html.erb. Yeah. In what directory? Same the same directory. And, and what, under the view. Yeah, because it's right there. Yeah. yeah, it's another page. Okay, but then this was generated. Who generated this file? See how good your memory is. Where did this file come from? I didn't write it. Did you generate it? You did generate per se, yeah. and it created this file. Yeah, and what was the generate generate? It was, it was Rails generate. Say, say uh, controller. controller say hello goodbye. Now we can parse that. Rails generate controller name, list of actions. So if I said say hello goodbye how are you whatever, I would have four methods in the file. I would have four view files, one for each one. Okay. Okay. So we have two URLs. So let's do a link between them, shall we? Now, how, how do you do a link in HTML? Anybody know? Okay. Is that the URL you want to go to? What's that? Say, say what it should be. Just I'm, I'm your typer. Dot HTML. Maybe 
Here's the URL I want. Pardon? It's really slash say slash goodbye. I thought you already did Um, doesn't matter where I am. It's it's an href like any href. I have to give the URL. It's not. There's no magic happening here. It's just text. So it's a regular piece of HTML. It's a relative reference. A relative. I think that's what it's called. A relative reference to that URL. So basically, let's see if it works. So I refresh it. Not this one. The other one. Okay, there's something that looks like a link here. The URL, the, the, this looks pretty good. You always can get a little mixed up with relative versus absolute. So let's just click on it and see if it works. Boom. So now I have a link between two pages. Building block for everything, for all your commands, your menus, and everything else. Okay? So let's put a link back from goodbye to hello. Who can dictate for me? Tell me what file to go to and what to type. Who's, who's courageous? Yes? No, no, a hand went up first. Uh, so what file? You want to go to file goodbye.html.emergy. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then you want to type uh, mrkk hrf equals uh, quote slash say slash Hello, quote, angle bracket, um, I'm responding to hello. Sure. <laughs> okay, what else? Uh, angle bracket slash A, angle bracket. All right. Boom. Boom, <laughs> boom. Boom, boom. Okay. Pardon? <laughs> Eventually, the novelty will end. <laughs> okay. A lot of magic in here. Okay. So you're gonna have to go over and over and over until until it really sticks, and we'll do that. Um. Okay. Pardon me? What happens if you want a link from something you did? Um, well, talk it through. Well, so you, so give you, me a scenario. So you need to embed a Ruby code that will create that link. Right. I mean, basically what you have to do is, if you look back at your code, instead of having a fixed bit of text here, you, yeah, you end up with something that looks like this. But instead of text, There's actually much better ways of doing this, but call to database. Yes, because the quotes are in HTML. The HTML needs the quotes. So basically, I'm putting the quote, then I'm calling the database to get whatever turns into. Now, in practice, you don't call the database. You probably have a helper function or something built in. And there's actually many more help things to simplify the conceptual. Any other questions? What's mysterious here? What's magical? What's totally confusing? Or do you think you get it? Okay, let me look at let me show one more thing. Uh, which is how the heck did the routing even work? Never talked about that. I just sort of assumed it. Well, a very f uh, a file that you're gonna learn to love is called the routes file. The stuff in green is comments, it's built in there by the Rails uh, generator. And it has very shorthand help to remind you what the options are. Okay? But the only parts of this file that are actually here are these two lines. The router actually, if you get rid of the comments, is that. Okay? And basically it's this, these two lines, of course, there's a lot of code that sits behind these, says that this server is going to accept get requests for these two URLs. And because of convention over configuration, people complain about this. It just happens that the file name of the controller is called 
say dot control dot dot brb, and it just happens that the view for hello is called hello dot brb, and it just happens that the directory that view is in is called say, and all those coincidences is why you can be so sparse. You can say so little because this command get is by the way this is just Ruby code again. It's all just Ruby code. Easy to forget that. It looks like a declarative language, and it is in a way. But I can say here, puts, I am running the router. OK, and I don't even know what's going to happen, which is always fun. I refresh the page, but now if we go look at the output, oops, we'll see somewhere in here. Uh, I didn't put the, the usual stars to make sure you can find it. We'll put. Refresh, go over here, there it is. OK, it's just Ruby code. Now, there's no ever any reason to do what I just did. But I just want to illustrate that somewhere in the server, when it was modified, it ran through this, um, this router declaration, executed it, which means these, are two, these two are methods, these two guests. They're just methods, magical methods, that create these tables. They create the routing tables. Okay? And they analyze, because of the parsing of this with the slash, that that must be the controller name, and that must be the action name. And then they go look in the directory structure and find a directory called say, and find in it two files called hello and goodbye, and bingo, it works. So for instance, if I nastily went over here to my views and renamed this file to be x goodbye, now I'm going to mess up the router, because it thinks it knows what the file is supposed to be called. I just renamed it. Okay. So what happens when I do refresh, I get that. Why? It tells you why. Basically, it was looking for a directory in here called goodbye, and it was there. How would you rename it? Um, well, basically, the way to think about it is, that you could, if you have this error, you would say something's going wrong. The route is, is being parsed and producing information about what the controller is and what the view is, and that information is not verified. Okay, so I would first look at the router, at the routes.rb. I would see here that basically there are only two legal routes. One is looking for controller say, view hello, the other is looking for or action hello, it does say action goodbye. So hence, I would now go look at my file name to see what was wrong. This is different from this error. Let me fix this again. Uh, this error, so this works again. But if I put it here, the error is going to happen somewhere else. The first time, the, error, the router properly parsed the URL but couldn't find what it expected to find in the server. In this case, it's not going to be able to parse the URL. It doesn't believe that that's a legal URL. So you're going to get a different error message. No route matches. OK? OK. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Pardon? Uh, four or four. Yeah. yeah, in general, that's, you know, you can't find the page. You know? Okay. Yes? So, if it cannot find that, then is there a place to choose all the pages? No, no. This is a debugging output because the server is running in development mode. And in fact, let's, let's just quickly. Now we can go kill the server by just typing Control C, no big deal. And uh, do you remember? I mean, is it do I put here production or colon production? I forget. Let's see. No. Pardon? Rails help server. Let's see if it gives something useful. Nope. Ah. Server help maybe. Okay, let's try that. Okay, nope, that didn't help much. Uh, with dash, H. with dash, okay, Rails 
Somebody look up running a Rails server in production mode. Google it and let me know. Um, OK, anybody? Dash E production, okay. So that Rails server dash environment production. Okay, now we're running the server in production mode, and the only reason I wanted to do this was I wanted to make this error happen and see how it's different. That one you've seen. If you've seen, if you see an error message that looks like this on the web, you know that somebody's running Rails and they have not done a nice job on an error page. Because you've seen things like this, right? You can immediately know it's Rails. So that's the production mode uh, error message. But when you're in development mode, and the way we switch development mode is you just kill the server, because it's just a Ruby application, run it again without that. Now the server comes up, same code, and the error message is a lot more friendly, much more useful. OK. Because that's just CSS and right, right. JavaScript. So, yeah. Right. In fact, just um, use Google as your friend. You know, look how to do this. There's actually plugins to Rails to make that easy. I think it may be called Rails Boot Stack. OK. Pardon? I said it wouldn't be fun to do it yourself. No. Listen, if you find yourself writing difficult code, always stop and say, has somebody done this already? Because chances are there's a gem. Chances are there's a gem. OK? And bad on you if you redo something that somebody else did before. You're just wasting your time and your brain. OK. You know, sometimes you go like, oh, it's a challenge. I want to see if I can really do it. Forget that. There's plenty of challenges that you have to do. So the ones you don't have to do, don't do them. You know, save yourself. Because there's lots of hard stuff that you will have to do. OK. I want to walk through again. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Instead of that, um, I bet some of you did not follow along, right? So everybody, I'm going to stop talking. Let's take 20 minutes. Everybody do this from the book themselves and get it to work. You have the book with you, everybody? No. Yes. Yes, no. Just yes, sir. I cannot hear you. What's your number? Yes. Okay. So wait, hang on. Before we get into that, oh, hang on. I mean, and I will wrote for circulate from three to three twenty. Please do that. If you don't have the book, I have a copy. And if you don't have a book, sit next to somebody who does and do do peer program. Everybody, twenty minutes. Work on this chapter. Instant gratification. Noranda, what's your just Noranda Brandeis? Oh, yeah. But, but you have the book? Yeah, I don't like the Okay. Maybe pair up. Um, when you work in twos, that way if you get stuck, you can just debate together why you're getting stuck. You did it already, probably, right? Okay, why don't you two of you work together? Um, somebody, everybody work in twos, please. Preferably somebody who has a who has a book with somebody who does not have a book. Everybody work it too. Oh my client doesn't have a I mean oh yeah. Yeah, I don't know. 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 I don't know.
So the favorite has a problem that it can't, the JavaScript is not working. So who stuck with the JavaScript there? Other than you guys. You guys stuck with the JavaScript? Okay, good. Anybody else stuck with the JavaScript there? Okay, good. Who are you working with? Who's your partner? I get So, are you able to go with Yes. When I went to type in Rails new demo, it wouldn't. It said it couldn't find Railities. Rail types. Are you running the? Wait, I'm not running the bagels. I didn't know I was supposed to. Oh come on! I tried. I did. But don't do it now. Don't do it now. So I have a big How did you talk? Yeah. Are you on the Are you on the what do you call it? Okay, uh, I'll start back. Yeah. Do it in Vagrant, and then I'll get out of the Uh, 
And now I just have this to the board, so we have all these different folders and we have the running yeah. of the So under the app, how do you get in touch with all these folders and compilers? So we already have a Yeah. Are you, are you in the big 
Yeah, I mean, it's not a Yeah, I mean, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's not a 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 so I go to I type in Rails server. Well, first you have to create your package. So, um, no, that was just a I think I'm Oh, yeah, this was a creation. Yep. So I say real server. Can I do an LS? Yeah. So, oh, okay. Okay, now. Okay, now the next thing was. Why is it putting out the white Yeah, why are you going to do it? I don't even start the real server. Oh, yeah, right there. So that's the first you the what did we do in this the the back to the Oh, it turns out very Yeah, this terminal is Also, I'm afraid of calling to I don't want to stop. I can do that. Oh, is Google Time Police show up? Please don't do that. Oh, you can do that. I'm telling you. Google's going to have that. Oh, they will. Which means they are. When they come up with their actions, Yeah, we're good. We're good. Yeah, so, 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 so,
we have the server up, the web page is up. Yeah. 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 How do you fix it? Well, you should just have to install it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, 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 Okay. Anybody still dead in the water? Be honest. Okay, good. Uh, uh, uh. You still dead in the water? Well, you have to turn the egg and flounder in that. Okay, but not dead. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of things, everybody. So a lot of the problems that you'll see this, I and mean, this is where people go nuts developing real software for real systems, is once you get the tricky computer science, complexity, magical algorithm stuff done, that's the little piece, you don't have a system yet. Then you have to build a system. That's this piece. And this piece is full of knowledge ugliness. It's like the path is wrong, like the wrong version of Rails, or the database is the wrong database. That's what you're hitting. And one of the key things you learn in this class is, uh, hello, hi. One of the key things you learn in this class is, is how to solve your own problems, diagnose, troubleshoot, uh, and, and overcome these kinds of problems. So just, this is typical. That's why I've been such a jerk about Vagrant, because this is typical. I don't mind if you're not using Vagrant, but if you're not using Vagrant and you're dead in the water because of that, then it's not so good. That's one thing. Second thing, I wanted to mention a little bit that all of your homework submissions for the how is a URL in, uh, interpreted. A lot of them are very similar to each other. Now, I'm not making any claims, but I'm saying you saw probably the same how-to page, and you went through it, and you made some links. I'm a little concerned that because of me, because of the way I made, I wrote up the assignment, which was put the URLs in, it led people in a direction that was less thoughtful and more mechanical. Um, So that's it. That, that, that's all I'm going to say. I guess if, 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 in fact, somebody literally copied from somebody else, that's bad. Okay, so ask, look, look in the mirror and say, did I copy Joe's thing without understanding it? And I suggest you to correct that. But because the question is fairly cut and dry, it's not unusual the answer is similar, although all of you, except for one, I think, did not pick up on what I thought was one of the most important things, which was the parsing of the URL into its bits and identifying the part that's the other server, the part that is the, the path, and the part of it that's the parameters. I think Burke, you might have been the only, was it you that talked about it in your write-up? I think, anyway, one person I saw it and went like, nobody's talking about this. Uh, it's very, very important, much more important than the cache and all the stuff that everybody wrote up because you all saw it in the same how-to web page. Yeah, the cache is important, it's second order. First order is parsing of the URL, Burke is like excited, part, part, part of the URL. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, the fact that it goes over the web, comes back and delivers HTML. Okay? So, word to the wise, that exercise was not just for entertainment. It's so core to being successful at this stuff. Whether it's Rails or Node.js, it doesn't matter. You have to get this thing in your head. Okay? Sorry? You're the one who did it? That's it? Okay, excellent. Well done. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, if you think that you might have accidentally have done a brain merge or a mind meld with somebody else, uh, you have time to correct it. But I don't, I'm not surprised that things are similar because it's, you all went to the same how-to page. Okay, now I'm going to review once more. That's how important this is and that's, uh, that's how much I want you to really understand this, how this process works, okay? The URL is typed into the client, which is usually a web browser but could be something else. It could be typed or it could be entered in because a program is doing it. It is parsed and broken up into pieces. The first piece, which is the host name, is this part, sample.org, is used to figure out where the server is. And the server can be on the moon and you're on Earth. It doesn't matter. That whole request is sent over the network using a protocol called ACVP to the server. The server's job, the whole rail server, or it could be a Node.js server, or it could be a uh, C-sharp.net server, it's always the same. Its sole job is to take that 
path and somehow convert it to a bunch of HTML. Remembering that one web page almost always, like a Google.com even has nothing on it almost, has dozens of other URLs on it. So this process happens many, many times. Um, I won't do it now. But if you turn on the debugging on your browser, you can actually see it show all the URLs and how long each one takes. So any one page always has lots of URLs. But I'm talking about one URL. It parses it, gives it to the Rails server. The Rails server gets say slash hello question mark print equals one. The router is the one that analyzes that and breaks it into smaller pieces still. The, the, the piece at the end, the final keyword, and whatever arguments, that's called the action and the arguments. That's set aside. Everything before that is a path, like a directory path. Say it could be like, if you, if you start looking at any app, any web app, whether it's uh, Facebook or Google or whatever, you'll see a certain logic to these slashes. They tend to be like app slash purchase slash shopping cart slash item slash checkout. Often you can read the, command, the, the words in the URL and they become kind of a, a, an expression of a command. That whole, everything but the last part is used by the router in the Rails server to figure out what the controller is that knows how to generate the HTML. Okay? The controller is going to be called, in this case, say.rb, and it's guaranteed to include a method called hello. And if there's another URL called goodbye, it's going to contain another method called goodbye. If you type say slash how are you, it's going to find the controller and say this controller does not have how are you in it. So if I say, well, it's not even get that far. It's not even going to get that far. If I actually can uh, jump to my routes.rb really quick and add a route as simple as this, and I'm going to say, how are you? I'm going to create an inconsistency in my Rails application right now because the router is told to look for a controller called say, which will contain an action called how are you. But when the router goes and looks at the controller called say, it's not going to find a, a action called how are you. Yes? So if you set up your controller and your views and everything, and then later you say, oh, I really wish this controller had one more thing, how would you add that? Just type in. Like I just like okay. Let me just show you the error, and then I, then I'll fix it. Okay. Now I do refresh, and I say, "How are you?" This is a legal path, but there's no action called "How are you?" and say control. Okay, now I'm going to put it in. It's still not going to work. Extra credit. Anybody can say why it's not going to work. Well, it's going to work. Well, I'm not sure actually. I'll take it back. Yes, exactly. Okay, and just modified, that's it. Refresh. Okay, missing templates. That is the confusing word for view. There's no how are you that HTML that ERB, which is going to be looking for in the in the directory called here. Views say, because that's what it is. And I can now go here and say new file. And all I'm going to put is how are you? Because that's legal HTML. That's legal HTML, right? I'm going to call it how are, oops. So those are the only three pieces being to add. Yep. Page. Oops, error. Uh, got to rename it. Yeah, I know. Well, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here. Uh, how are you? That HTML. Now, I go over here and Boom. So I added the route, added the controller action, added the view. Okay? There you get, notice it's just Ruby code. I modify it, I can run it. Boom. Without going back and doing anything to the server. So the router parses it. Everything except for the last part tells it what the controller is. And this can have multiple bits. You can have nested directories of controllers. Okay? Finds the controller, looks for the action, executes the action, all the steps, and at the end of it, looks for a view with the same name, renders it, which processes through HTML, produces, H sorry, processes through ERB, produces HTML, gets sent back to the controller, 
sent back to the server, sent back to the other to the client. And that's how it works. Yes? So the get variables, are those just like parameters? Exactly. So I didn't even touch that, but let's, let's, um, let's do that. Oops. So let's go over here and say, I'm, I'm going to go from memory, so I think it's, let's try params dot inspect. Just guessing. Uh, ah, perfect. Okay, now you see the parameters that go to the to the action. So I actually say print equals one. Let's study this. Doesn't this look like a hash? That's what it is. You're getting a hash. You can do with it whatever you like. The the action is getting a hash that has the following components. A key called controller that has the controller name, a key called action which has the action name, and any other keys corresponding to the arguments on the URL. Okay, as many as you like. So, uh, how do I put an additional argument? What's the punctuation? Oh, uh, huh? And Brandeis, cool. Uh, you may or may not agree with that, but anyway. Um, I just typed it in. There it is. Now this hash has one more thing in it. Okay? Let's play with this some more. Let's play with this some more. So let's do, instead of doing this, do a few more things. Percent equals, uh, let's see. So this is the params. I'm going to go here. Uh, I'm going to go uh, class. Percent equals params of class. I'm going to put. Um, yeah, leave it at that. Okay, so now I go back here. Class, action controller, parameters. Oh, I forgot to put the parameters, right? Uh, parameters of class, parameters inspect. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe I should have done this way. It's better. Okay, there you go. So the params are going to the action, and in the turn, continuing into the control into the view, is a hash, which contains these given things: controller, action, and then in addition, any other parameters that come right out here. And then you can write code to do whatever you want. Okay. Hmm. Where's the thing I'm looking for? So, okay, so that's the process, and we'll, we'll, we'll review this again a few more times, but that's the process. Um, let me just see what else is in this chapter. Oh, yeah, I'm going to touch on this on the next, in the next class. Um, there's this, nah, I won't even touch it. I'll, 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 it's part of the database. So the model has a database, and there's a bunch of code to allow you to access the database from within Ruby. And that, that package of code is called the, the um, active model. Uh, layer or component, and it connects a relational database to Ruby, and we'll talk about that at the very, I think at the very next class. Active record, sorry, not active model, active, re active record. Um, and then the code, uh, you know, this is sort of rehashing everything I said. The, the, so the layer called active record is the layer that connects the control, the, the, data, the relational database, MySQL, SQLite, whatever, to Ruby. Um, then there's a layer that does all the view processing, ERB and all that stuff that's called active, I forget, active view. And then there's the controller. And by the way, if you look at the code, up, if you look at the code, you'll see in the controller, for example, here, you'll see that it's inheriting from action controller base. So it, a lot of the stuff I'm doing is just inheriting from the parent controller subsystem. So the whole business with viewing, and uh, there'll be a lot of other things we learn about validation and whatever else, is coming because the key objects, the key classes in Rails are derived from base classes which are built into Rails. So even though my code is very short and very simple, um, the fact that it's inheriting from application controller is how it's getting all of its other logic. That's how all this flow is controlled. So in general, you'll see that patterns throughout Rails, which is a class inherits from a Rails class. The Rails class has a lot of stuff in it that implements essentially all the 
behavior of the rail server, and then your class has very little stuff in it, which corresponds to the specific behavior of your particular Rails application, rail server. And you'll see that pattern throughout. Um, if you look at the routes file, you'll see a you know, similar thing. You know, th in this case, it's written a little bit differently, but again, it looks like a configuration file. It looks like a meta language on purpose to make it easy to understand, but really it's just room code. And you can imagine that every time those get methods get executed, what's going on is a big table of routing information is getting built by Rails. It gets built only once, once the, when the server starts up. It analyzes it, generates all these routing tables, dispatch tables, so when the, route, the, the URL comes in, it's very, very fast at locating the controller that has to be invoked. Okay? Um, you don't need to work, try not to worry about all that. Try to get this flow solid in your head. Because this is the, the key to it, is understanding how things get dispatched. Later on, we'll peel the layers away from the, the other elements. And I keep talking, I talk about Rails, obviously, but these principles are fundamental web application architecture principles. No looking at your web cell phone during class, please. Thank you. Um, the fundamental Rails, um, the fundamental application architecture, web application architecture issues. Okay, you'll see it in uh, a C Sharp or a .NET server, web server, you'll see it in an Apache server, you'll see it on a Node.js server. It's the same exact thing. People implement it differently. The terms of model view controller, standard terms, the standard architectural pattern that is used throughout. Um, and the, the basic notion is with MVC, the, 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 the principle is M contains the data. It's not active, it's not alive, it's like a database. Here's a person, here's a product, here's an animal, whatever. The view knows how to display on the screen. It could be a screen with HTML, but if you're writing an Android application where the pages are not HTML, it's still a view. The view takes whatever data is selected and renders it on the screen, and then the controller is a traffic cop. Inputs come in, outputs go out. So in, in the world of web applications, What's coming in are web requests, and what are going out are HTML. But if you're talking about a graphical user interface like an Android, what's coming in are gestures. Click on a button, swipe a screen, the GPS changes location. And get similarly, they go into a controller, decides what to do, looks at, at a database of some kind, and uses a view to render it. That principle exists, and the separation of concerns, which is a very, you know, big concept in computer science and software engineering applies here especially as well. Okay. Yes? Just one thing that I want to add is that uh, never ever use models directly in your views. Uh, always controller is it acts as a proxy. You don't have, you, you shouldn't use your models directly. And as we go through, you'll understand better what that, how that comes into play. Um, any questions? Any, Lynn, any questions right now on your mind? Okay. Um, there was something else I wanted to touch on. Let me just go look at my... Yep, we've covered all that stuff. Um, so let's look at the next class, actually. Why don't we do that? So that's Friday, building the dossier. Now, we're not going to go immediately into coding, but um, if you can't resist, and I hope you can't resist, you probably don't have the time, though. But you certainly feel free to mess around with Rails. Now, notice that the Rails app that we just created together, there's no data, right? So it's all static. So bringing the database is going to add another uh, another uh, level of functionality, and we're going to touch on that very soon. Um, and your application is going to be like that. You're going to have a relational database. Uh, there's a couple of models we will use. And, um, and for example, if you need um, 
to display on a screen uh, a point that corresponds to a person and coming from a GPS, then what would happen is in the controller that's invoked to display that screen, there's going to be code that's going to ask the GPS where you're located. The GPS is going to give you lat long. You're going to figure out a way to convert that from numbers into a position on, within a, a graphic, and you're going to then set all that information up and then let the view display. So it's going to be the same principle. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do on Friday is obviously continue working on PA3 at the time, but you probably don't. More important, it, just to know that this is happening, and it's not going to be due until next week, obviously, but it's, it's on the plate. And most important is to work with your team to start nailing down the beginnings of the functionality for your product. Okay? And we're going to talk a lot about that on Friday in detail. Um, but to give you a preview, what, what, what you need to do is spend at least a couple of hours, uh, well, first read independently and try to understand, uh, and then spend at least a couple of hours with your team to talk about the functionality of your product in the simplest, most way. And these readings will give you ideas of how to approach that. But let me talk about that a little bit. So basically, you're going to sit around and say, by yourself or together, okay, what are the key commands, what are the key things that we want the user to be able to do when they walk up to the screen of our product? What are the most important things, okay? And you'll start thinking about what are the most important. And, and it may be, you know, uh, filter, you know, filter for, for products, or it may be, you know, add an appointment, or whatever it is. And you're going to start thinking about what is your home page going to look like to allow them to be able to do these things. And the idea is, and the term of the, the term paper code is that who's taking the UX course? Right? A lot of you have probably, yes? Uh, not that many, huh? User interface course. Yeah, that one. HCI course, yes. Yeah. Okay, so you and you and you know paper prototype from last year as well. So basically, you take the the, the key. The most important screens of your product, and you lay them out, you know, on paper. I mean, I know some of you will insist to use some tool, which I'm not against, but my advice is don't do it because generally, if you use a tool like Photoshop or whatever, you're going to spend a lot of time making it look pretty, and not enough time thinking about what where the buttons are. Better to have a screen that has the, the, the bits on it. And you think about the, the key functionality of your product. What are the things people have to do? And then you start looking at the home screen and say, where are all the links or buttons to allow them to do that. And you're going to design the key and preliminary design. You're going to change it, obviously. You're going to preliminarily design. So this is not how pretty it looks. This is like what are the what are the widgets on it? The key screens of your application. And then you're going to think about how they connect to each other. How do I get from this screen to that screen? Well there's this link that I click on and from an individual paper prototype screen you build a user user experience, a US flow diagram. Now, if you think about it, each of those paper prototypes becomes used later on. But for now, try to think about that. And as you're doing that, start collecting a list of all the things the product has to do, as we talked about before, stories, right? Very simple, high level. But as you start enumerating them, you'll see there's a lot of them. Start collecting them. Don't worry yet too much about which one you should do first or which one is more important. You're going to be doing a lot of sorting and filtering of that list. But start building that list, OK? So what we'll do on Friday is we're going to look at, whoops, we're going to look at each of your, I'll have to update this thing. Um, yeah, product by product discussion. I'm going to basically want to look at each product. This is the crux of it, okay? We're going to look at each product and look at, I'll add some more detail to the stage you know, in the next day or two. But I'm going to look at each product and see what you came up with and we're going to discuss it. We're going to say, okay, well, well you forgot about this. What about that? And look at what everybody did. So what I hope to see is one or more JPEGs or PDFs, whatever you like, showing individual screens of your app, as you imagine them now. I know it's going to be preliminary. And then lines connecting them, showing, well, if I click on this button, I'm going to go to that screen. OK? This is, this is a uh, creative moment in this project. This is when you start thinking really about how to take your vague idea and turn it into something that's a product. And keep it simple, right? Don't put all the functionality in that you can imagine. Think about what is the core most functionality and put that in, OK? This will be the first attempt. We're going to do, do it several times. But give it your best shot, because the sooner you establish some of these basic foundational points, the sooner you can start coding and build the product out, OK? Start building it.
okay? And um, keep posting on Piazza if you have questions or send us an email, get help if you're stuck, get help if after you start talking about it, you're not really sure what you're supposed to do. Please get help, ask, don't be stuck, and come Friday going like we couldn't do it because we didn't understand X. All right? Questions? Good. Five minutes early. Done. Sorry?